just a minute, we're going to have a prelude. Uh, Dr. Moots will play. Our acolytes will, will light the candles. I invite you to take that time uh, to center yourselves, to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Uh, this Sunday, uh, we'll, in addition to preaching, we'll hear a little bit about Kairos. We'll celebrate our third graders, and they're receiving a Bible. It's going to be a great day. So take some time, pass the peace to those around you. Let's worship God. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship. Would you please stand if you're able in mind or spirit? I raise my eyes towards the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. God won't let your foot slip. Your protector won't fall asleep on the job. My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will protect you from all evil. God will protect your very life. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will protect you on your journeys from now until forever from now. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Good morning. Please join me in singing our first hymn this morning, Rejoice, Ye Pure in Heart. Rejoice, ye Rejoice, 
Join me in our affirmation of faith. A statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, who reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us, and we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. Morning everybody, my name is Stephen Fisher, I'm the Family Ministries Director here at St. Stephen's and at this time, which would normally be our children's moment time, we have a special presentation because today is our third grade Bible presentation. Before we begin, in a moment I will read the names of the recipients and have them join me up here at the front, but if there is anybody present who has a third grader or someone who has gone beyond third grade who didn't receive a Bible, we do have extras. So I make sure to come and find me at the end of the service or even come up now if you wish and we can make sure that people get that Bible to them because we believe at St. Stephen's that access to the Bible is incredibly important and we can read the stories from Scripture that transform our own stories. And that's so important to us. It's in our vision statement and it hangs upon our walls. So at this time, I'd like to invite, if they are present or people who can collect for them, Everett Ramirez, Marietta Schmidt, Braden Schmidt, and Grace Gossett to come and join me at the front. Hi. So, Grace, Braden. Okay, we'll just stay here for one second. We've got a few things. I'm going to read something out, and the congregation's going to repeat something after me in a moment. And then you guys are going to repeat something after me in a moment, too, okay? But I'll tell everybody when it's their turn. So, receive the Word of God. Learn its stories and study its words. Its stories belong to us all. And these words speak to us all. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another, for we are the people of God. So, everybody in the congregation, please repeat after me. We rejoice in this step. We rejoice in this step. In your journey with God. In your journey with God. We pray God will guide you. We pray God will guide you. And God will guide us. And God will guide us. We will learn together. We will learn together. And grow in our love. And grow in our love. For God's word. For God's word. Okay. And Grace and Braden, you're gonna repeat after me, okay? You're not on microphone, but just make it as loud as you can, okay? So the word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thanks be to God. Let's have a round of applause for our third grade Bible recipients. Uh, if there is anybody here who wants to collect the Bible, so I'm assuming we can probably send is Marietta's to home. So we'll send that to. Uh, come find me at the end. I'll be in the Norfolk lobby area at the back, and we'll make sure those who need a Bible can go home with one. Thanks, everybody. Good Thanks, job. guys. Good job. Would you all join me in a word of prayer? 
Loving God, we give thanks for the way that you love us. We rejoice in opportunities to be reminded that we are to approach your word, the stories in scripture with the wonder of children. God, we pray that each time we open our Bibles, we do it with new eyes, ready to be excited by and immersed in the stories you tell us of who you are and who we are. God, as a church, we continue to pray for this church and the community it sits in, that we might be transformed by you to look more like the kingdom of God. God, we pray for our world, that the whole world might look more like the kingdom of God, we know it needs it. We pray for all those who are experiencing violence, whether in ongoing war, in difficult or broken homes, in neighborhoods that seem or are unsafe and difficult. God, bind up and mend our broken world. And we pray for all those who are sick and hurting, for the lonely and the lost, for anyone who needs an extra special dose of love today. Give us the eyes to see those we can help and go to the places we cannot go. God, we pray all of these things and the prayers of our hearts because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so now we join our voices together in the prayer that he taught us each in the language of our own hearts, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Day comes from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength because he considered me faithful. So he appointed me to ministry, even though I used to speak against him, attack his people, and I was proud. But I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and without faith. Our Lord's favor poured all over me, along with the faithfulness and love that are in Jesus Christ. This saying is reliable and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the biggest sinner of all. But this is why I was shown mercy, so that Christ Jesus could show his endless patience to me, first of all. So I am an example of those who are going to believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king of the ages, to the immortal, invisible, and only God, may honor and glory be given to him forever and always. Amen. Inspired words for beloved people. Lord, Lord, transform transform us us through through its its hearing. Amen. Thank you, Pam. So, um, some of you might have a lot of friends from high school still in your life. I've, I've got a few that uh, are still friends of mine, but none that are really close. You know, I grew up in Austin, and a lot of them stayed there or went to other places. There's not that many people that I went to high school with here in Houston. Um, but one of my best friends in high school who has stayed close to me, even though he lives in another state now, uh, really didn't like me very much for a very long time. Uh, so, in middle school. Uh, we didn't go to the same schools. So we didn't know each other very well. But when we were freshmen in high school, uh, I had the locker above his. Uh, and some of you might know uh, something about me, and that is that I, I am not known for being a neat and tidy person uh, by anyone. Uh, and so, so my locker was perpetually spilling out and over, and I also was often running late and thought I was really cool because I played football and whatever else. And uh, so I'd be, you know, racing to get to my stuff while he's, you know, squatted down, getting stuff out of his locker on the bottom. And I'd fling it open and stuff would fall all over him and I'd be running late and whatever else. He couldn't stand me. Uh, He also uh, is a very quiet person. I am not that. Um, And, but 
we went to the same church, uh, and uh, my friend Micah is the hardest working uh, and best hearted person I know in many ways. Micah uh, has a hard time dealing with individual people, like he doesn't necessarily want to spend a lot of time uh, with a lot of people, but if what is asked is do something for the greater good of the community, whether it's a construction project or doing errands or favors for somebody or just asking for anything, Mike is the friend who would drive across six states to show up at your door to help you with whatever you needed because he's that kind of a person. But, you know, he couldn't stand me until we figured out uh, at church that we worked really well together on things and ended up becoming really good friends. He was a groomsman in my wedding. Um, And I really thank God for giving me a friendship with someone who was so different than I am. Um, And I think that that's something we really ought to consider when we hear this passage of Scripture is not just, you know, it's easy to remember that uh, Paul and those who wrote in his stead love to remember that Paul was this persecutor of the faith, uh, which is true, that uh, because of his understanding of his uh, Jewish faith, he found the Christian faith to be an affront to it and spent a lot of time uh, working against the church before his moment of conversion. We also know from Paul's writings, as we Uh, talked about last week, he could be a little bit difficult a person to deal with and get along with. He rubbed people the wrong way, was very insistent on a certain way of doing things. Um, But it's worth remembering that Paul's great evangelism was to people who had not been a part of the Jewish faith. And so Paul, as this incredibly pious and devout and learned Jewish Christian, was always working with people very different than himself in his early building of the church, right? We see in Acts that uh, more or less Peter and Paul decide, you know, we're, we're going to split this job up because it's too much for us to do. So Peter, you're in charge of the church here and of helping uh, Jewish followers of Jesus to live into their faith, and I'm going to go to the ends of the earth and introduce this faith to new people because God has called us to do that, and I feel equipped for it. And so Paul goes out and starts working with people who in addition to finding him to be possibly a little off-putting as an individual, are from very different backgrounds and lives than he is, right? They live in Gentile communities or have grown up in very different faiths than the Jewish faith, uh, and they have this guy come to them and tell them about Jesus who is so different than they are but still somehow able to connect with them in a meaningful way, uh, and it changes the world by changing who uh, is a part of this church. You know, the, it's easy in, we did it just this morning, when we read these letters in the New Testament to kind of skip over the introductions and the closings of greetings to you and to you and to you and to you, but it means something that to Paul and to the early writers of Scripture, they needed to name their friends who they were talking to so that those people knew how much they mattered to Paul and, by extension, to the church. Um, and... And so I I think the lesson for us to dig into today is how much better we are and can be when we find ourselves making friends with and working with people a little bit different than we are. Uh, So a lot of you know that I love to spend time outdoors. Uh, My primary outdoor hobby uh, is deer hunting, of course, but I just like to be outside in nature a lot. And what people who have been hunting a lot know is the actual hunting piece is not the biggest deal. It's, it's a chance to go and spend time and slow down in nature and watch the world go by at a very different pace in a very different way uh, than you're used to doing. And a lot of my favorite hunting stories have nothing to do with you know, harvesting animals or any of that, but just what I observe in the natural world. Uh, many years ago, I was sitting in a deer blind uh, in a season where the summer leading up to it, uh, through the beginning of the season, had just been unbelievably dry. We were in the midst of a nasty drought. I think it was 13 or 11 uh, back when, you know, the last really dry spells before these recent ones when, you know, lakes in the hill country were down to nothing and it was really, really difficult conditions. Uh, And I was sitting uh, in my deer stand just watching stuff and it was a pretty slow hunt. And then uh, off coming out of the brush, I saw a coyote. And, you know, see coyotes from time to time, generally pretty cool. I think they're neat animals. They're fun to watch. Uh, and the coyote comes trotting out of the brush, and I'm like, well, that's kind of neat. And right behind the coyote is a badger. And I went, what? Uh, so those of you who don't know, uh, neither coyotes 
nor badgers are animals known for being particularly gregarious or friendly creatures. Uh, they're pretty territorial. They're known to... Uh, so coyotes uh, have managed to expand their range because they're relatively secretive and try to give a wide berth to anything that might be uh, threats to them. Um, they don't spend a lot of time with anything other than occasionally a few other coyotes. Uh, and badgers, you might know, are notoriously territorial and angry and mean animals. They're real low to the ground. They're real compact. They like to back themselves into holes or into thick brush and protect themselves with their big nasty claws and teeth. Badgers are not known for being friendly animals uh, by any one stretch. But this coyote and this badger didn't just come out of the same spot. They like ran around together and were doing stuff. I'm like, what in the world is going on? So uh, because I live in the world with the internet, I started doing some research online about what in the world could I could have witnessed. Uh, and it turns out that particularly in situations uh, like significant drought or other strains on the environment, uh, badgers and coyotes have figured out over eons of living in the same places that they have very different hunting skills that when prey becomes scarce really complement each other very well. Uh, and that if they become friends in the face of difficulty when there's not enough food, they both might survive a situation that they would not survive otherwise. Because coyotes can get out and run and can get stuff moving in a way that badgers simply can't keep up with. Uh, and badgers can get into holes and burrows and things and do things that coyotes can't do. And so badgers and coyotes work together in difficult circumstances to help one another to survive when they otherwise might not have done so. And in fact, many of the Native American tribes uh, from the part of the world where both of those animals uh, were native uh, have different stories and parables about what we can learn from the relationship between badgers and coyotes in situations of difficulty and need. And I, for one, think that life is so much richer when I experience things with people who have different experiences than I do. Uh, and sometimes I have found the best and most meaningful friendships in my life are the ones with folks who I might not have initially liked very much when I first met them, or who certainly didn't seem to have a ton in common with me necessarily. And I wonder if that might be true for anyone else here. Uh, if you might have found at some point in your life or in some place in your life the relationships that helped you the most, where you did the most growth, were relationships with people who had different perspectives than you do, who had different life experiences, who were simply different than you were. Um, you know, in the passage out of Timothy, we're reminded that Paul had a difficult past and was a significant sinner, uh, but what he's doing is reminding people that people of all different sorts are loved by God and can bring glory to the kingdom of God. Uh, that everyone is a beloved child of God, no matter what they've done in their past, no matter how difficult they might be to deal with, that in all of these things, God is able to do more good when people come together across meaningful difference. Um, it's a part of why I love the United Methodist Church, uh, as a church that has consistently tried to allow people of different perspectives to worship together, to learn from each other, to be a church together. Uh, it's why I value so much my friendships and relationships with people with different experiences than I have. Uh, it's why I, I love doing the work of ministry. Um, so earlier this morning, uh, you might have seen a few of us running over here. You might have noticed that my shoes are a little different than they normally would be on a Sunday morning. We had our second family worship service over in the fellowship hall, and some of you might have come in for breakfast and then come here. I know I see a few faces of folks that have been in both services. Um, and while we were there, uh, it was really cool to see all of these different folks come together. And I did something then, uh, and I did it when we did this a couple weeks ago too, here. I end sermons over there by giving people a question to talk about at their tables. And I tried it over here a couple weeks ago when we had our preview service for that service. And I got a couple emails from folks who had been worshiping with us online with their feedback and that they really liked it. And I heard from people here that they like talking to their neighbors. So I want to give you a second uh, to, to talk to your neighbors uh, as a way of ending this sermon rather than just saying in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I want to share it with all of you. Um, and so I want you to ponder the question, uh, 
have you ever become friends with someone you didn't like at first? And after you've talked about that question, the second question is, what did you learn about yourself doing that? So guys, if I can have us put the first question up for a minute, uh, and David, now's a good time for you to, to, to come down for after the sermon to, to talk about Kairos. And in just a minute, we'll switch to the other question, but talk to your neighbors about, have you ever become friends with someone you didn't like at first? Thank you. One of the first things I want to think about is why do I get involved with Kairos? On a spiritual basis, Matthew tells us, one of the marks of the followers is that you visited me when you were in prison. On a practical basis, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, considered ministry to Newgate minister as a vital part of his ministry, ministry to those prisoners. And I think almost more importantly, if we're going to control violence in society today, no matter what rules or regulations or other things we do, we have to change people's hearts. Violence comes from within a heart. And what better place to start to change people's hearts than the prisons where we send the worst offenders in our society. Cairo sends a message of a loving, forgiving God who wants to lead them to a better way of life. I'm hopeful that your heart and guidance to the Holy Spirit will help you support this ministry. Kairos begins with the chaplain, along with the warden, finding not the best, finding the most violent of the prisoners, the prisoners who hate the worst, and they're invited to spend a weekend entirely within the walls. They are forgiven of any daily routine, they talk, they listen, they discuss, and all they learn about is God's love. The inmates, we call them men in white, hear talks about the freely offered love of God, and they hear talks about how this love has changed people's lives. Each Kairos team member is involved in over 36 hours of training. That training is rigidly controlled and kept within the riverbanks. We don't discuss any particular religion. We don't discuss any specific beliefs. We try to tailor this so it can appeal to those who believe in our Christian God as well as anyone. 
We yeah. just want them to know. God loves them, and they can have that same love in their lives. Tyrell Sake Outside prepares over 1,600 dozen cookies. Since COVID, we have been purchasing some of those cookies, but they're all prepared for the prisoners. Each prisoner of the 42 inmates receives nine meals over the weekend. The meals cost $10 each. The weekend cost a total of ten to $12,000. The each inmate has a hand-colored placemat when he sits down for that meal. That placemat will have the first name only and the age of a school-age child who colored that in Sunday school. Many of the inmates will take them back with them to their cells because they don't have a refrigerator to put their children's pictures on. This is all they have to remind them of the love of children in this world. After the weekend, we invite them or require them to create what's called a prayer and share, where among themselves they talk. And then each month, our team members return to that prison on a Sunday to help them continue learning and growing in their faith. faith. I'm primarily asking you for prayers for this weekend. I'm going to, in the back of the narthex, I'll have some prayer, prayer chains. If you'll fill out the top line, we'll complete the other three. These are linked together in the brightly colored prayers surround the gymnasium, they surround the area where we meet for chapel, they surround the eating areas, and sometimes extend down the hall. The purpose of this prayer chain is to surround these prisoners with love, to let these prisoners know that people in the free world are praying for them. I'm also asking those of you who can, I have some meal tickets back there. If you would complete that meal ticket, if you don't have the, your check or something available today, you can leave it off at the church office next Sunday. And if you'll complete that second part of the meal ticket, the first tear off is your receipt, turn that other part in. As each prisoner comes in and sits down, he'll see a name and a city from someone who loves him enough to provide him a meal. Finally, and this is a very personal, selfish plea, pray for me that God can use me they can help me be an instrument because there's no feeling such as walking into those barbed wire fences, sometimes brick walls, knowing that around surrounding me are officers with high-powered rifles trained on everybody in that compound and will walk around the low of caged men. There's no other expression. These men are the most violent in society. And as we walk into that prison, and I'm going to try to sing, everybody bear with me, I'll link arms with other men, and we're going to be singing. They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. No greater message can be given to these men. And I thank St. Stephen for supporting this ministry. Thank you. Thanks, David. So like he said, David will be in the narthex uh, after church today and also next week. To answer any questions you have to solicit some help covering some of the meals for that event. Uh, I'm grateful to be a part of a church uh, with members that go out and help anybody in the world to know that we are all, without exception, beloved children of God. Uh, friends, during our offertory, you're invited to, to give online. Uh, if you want to give by cash or check, uh, there's uh, plates at the, at the exits that you can do so there. Uh, the link on screen will take you to the online giving page uh, for financial support for this church. I invite you to give and to give generously.
Okay, now am I on? Like I said, I'm really struggling with the microphone mute function today. Um, sorry about that. So, to summarize what I just said, family worship went great. Thanks to everybody that helped. Um, a week from today, following this service, so at about 11.30 a.m., we'll have a State of the Church meeting. Uh, our board chair, Emily Leffler, and I will kind of co-present there. We'll be talking some about what's going on here at St. Stephen's, and we'll have an updated financial report to give folks. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the broader denominational stuff, where the United Methodist Church is, uh, where we feel like we are on those things. So if you're interested and want to be here for that, that's next Sunday after worship. If you can't physically be here in person, uh, we'll put that on the same Zoom channel where we have Sunday school on Sunday mornings so that folks that uh, are homebound or traveling that want to participate can come and join us that way. Again, following this service a week from today, <coughs> excuse me, we'll have a State of the Church meeting uh, here in the sanctuary. Um, tonight, uh, from 5 to 7 at Great Heights Brewery, for the first time since... Last fall, we'll have our Great Heights Bible Study. Uh, it's a place to come and talk about uh, contemporary issues and stuff, as well as what's happening in our lives in a non-threatening setting. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Today we're talking about prayer, uh, why it matters, why we do it, uh, how it affects our lives. If anybody's interested in joining us, come talk to me after the service, and I'll give you any details that you need to know to be a part of that. Um, Messy Church returns on the 27th of this month. That's just a couple weeks away on Tuesday. Uh, it'll be in the fellowship hall like it always is from 5.30 to 7. You're invited to come and help. If we're always looking for more volunteers, we're looking for more kids, we're looking for their families, just come and join us for a really great evening of food and fun, and it'll be a lot of uh, fun and a mess. Um, starting on the first Tuesday in October, uh, I'll be leading a book study on Zoom at 7.30 at night. Uh, we've found uh, even you know one of the blessings that has come out of this crazy couple of years of pandemic and virtual and everything else is that um, for folks that either can't drive at night or who have small children, um, uh, Bible studies and stuff in the evenings during the week on Zoom seem to be more accessible so that folks can uh, participate from wherever they are. They don't have to find babysitters. They don't, again, have to drive in the dark. So at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday nights throughout October, we'll be reading the book Tattoos on the Heart. Uh, if you come to worship here regularly, you hear me pull stories out of that book pretty often to use in sermon illustrations, find it to be one of the best pieces of spiritual writing of the last half century at least uh, by Father Gregory Boyle, who leads the largest um, ministry to folks affected by gang violence in the world uh, out of uh, South Central Los Angeles. It's called Homeboy Industries. It's really great. So if you're interested in that, the book's widely available all over the place. It'll, again, it'll be Tuesdays during October. Uh, you're welcome to sign up online. We've got an events page open on the church website to sign up so we have an idea of how many people to prepare for for that class. That is all of the announcements that I have for you. So I invite you to stand in body or in spirit uh, for our closing hymn. <laughs> Clouds which are fountains of goodness and 
Friends, as our third graders read the Bibles that they take home, uh, I hope that as they read those stories, they truly are transformed by them, uh, and that in reading that they learn, uh, and this will be our benediction, that we are all, without exception, beloved children of God. Go in peace.